Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, What is Theocracy? In this video, we're going to be taking a look at what is Zionism. Now, at its simplest, Zionism is the belief that Jewish people should have their own nation state. In this way, it's it's somewhere between communitarian nationalism, the idea that particular nations of people based on ethnic, religious, cultural lines, etc., should have their own countries, check out our video on communitarian nationalism for more, and theocracy. Some proponents of Zionism argue for an explicitly theocratic project, while others advocate for a clearly secular one. This is due in part to the fact that Judaism can be classified separately as a religion, an ethnicity, or as a general culture. In this video, we're going to focus on the philosophical arguments for and against different forms of Zionism. We're not really going to focus on the historical or political processes that led to the formation of Israel, uh, but rather focus on the philosophical and ethical arguments for and against it, as well as for and against the type of state that it would be. Now, before digging into Zionism itself, it's important to make a few distinctions. Sometimes those that critique Judaism, Zionism, Israel, or the current Israeli government are accused of anti-Semitism or hatred, hostility, or discrimination against Jewish people. This is often assumed due to the fact that anti-Zionism is used as a mask or dog whistle for actual anti-Semitic beliefs. In this video, we will draw a strict and clear distinction between anti-Semitism, discrimination against Jewish people, and the more philosophical critiques of the religion of Judaism, such as critiques of the tenets of that religion, criticism of Zionism, i.e. criticism of the claim that Jewish people have a moral right to a nation state, Concerns with the state of Israel as it currently exists, such as objections to the current instantiation of Israel as the correct form of said Jewish state, and disagreements with the government, for example, concerns with Netanyahu's proposal to limit the powers of the judiciary. All of these are different viewpoints, and while some can be used for, as dog whistles for others, in this video we mean what we say, and a critique of Zionism is just that, nothing more. It's important to both acknowledge that opposition to Zionism, Israel, Netanyahu, etc. have been used as a veiled tool for anti-Semitism, but also that doesn't mean that these institutions should therefore be above critique, or that all objections to them are inherently racist or anti-Semitic, despite attempts from the current government of Israel to dismiss any criticism as inherently racist. It should be clear that someone could be a Zionist, but think that the current state of Israel fails to live up to that goal. For example, Jewish philosopher Martin Buber argued for a binational state in Israel where there was legal equality for Jewish and Palestinian people. Or someone could be a supporter of the current state of Israel, but disagree with the current government that's in power, as protests that have rocked the country uh, have happened in the last uh, weeks and months. It seems that there are quite a few Israelis that oppose Netanyahu. Conversely, there are American evangelical politicians that support both anti-Semitic groups, such as the Proud Boys, but are also active supporters of Israel because they believe that it will fulfill Christian prophecies and bring on the apocalypse, which for some evangelicals is apparently a good thing. All of this to say that criticism of Israel or Zionism can be independent of anti-Semitism in both directions. The objections offered in this video are to the philosophical position, not an attempt at veiled anti-Semitism. With all that out of the way, let's take a look. So, the roots of Zionism can be found in the nationalist movements of the 1800s, where various cultural groups and identities in Europe began seeking political autonomy, or in other words, associating country boundaries with cultural and ethnic groups. This was justified by an argument that individual ethnic groups had a right to self-determination. This communitarian nationalism faced varying levels of challenges for different groups, depending on how dispersed they were across other nations. This was therefore particularly challenging for Jewish people who were well dispersed throughout Europe and the Middle East, but had a clearly distinct culture and religion. An early advocate of Zionism, Moses Hess, argued that the Jewish people had the historic mission of spreading universal human harmony throughout the world, but could only do so uh, if they had a state homeland in Israel. They couldn't do so solely as a diaspora. 
Other early examples of Zionism defended it through explicit reference to anti-Semitism. Leopold Pinsker argued that Jewish people could not be assimilated into other cultures because while they could sometimes start to integrate with other societies, in the long run, they wouldn't be tolerated and would eventually be isolated, pushed out, or turned into scapegoats. Pinsker argued that this perpetual separateness could only be resolved if the Jewish people were given a homeland. Ahad Ha'am, on the other hand, focused less on anti-Semitism as a moral need for Zionism, but rather on Zionism as a bulwark against assimilation and loss of Jewish culture. For Ha'am, everyone has a sentiment of national belonging to a particular culture or ethnic group in the same way that one has inherent feelings of uh, connection towards one's own family. Now, Thomas Herzl is also associated with this stage of the movement, though he was more of a politician than a philosopher, less offering particular philosophical arguments for Zionism and more politically working towards its realization. Jacob Klatskin made an argument for Zionism based in another frame, based on land and language. For Klatskin, Zionism could be defended neither through solely secular or personal spiritual ties, because those could lead to assimilation and loss of culture, nor could it be defended through explicitly religious ties, because those excluded much of the experience of being Jewish and much of the Jewish community. For Klatskin, these were subjective and debated, and therefore couldn't be the central defining feature and important impetus for Zionism. Zionism, for Klatskin, should be rooted in objective criteria, specifically in land and language, that these ideas were essential to the Jewish experience, the desire to speak one's own language and settle in one's own land. While the secular definition of Jewish identity resonated in some circles, the exclusion of the diaspora who didn't speak Hebrew or moved to Israel when it was founded from that kind of essential Jewish identity led to the eventual marginalization of Klatskin's arguments and his ideas of framing Zionism solely around land and language. Other early Zionists grounded their views in socialism and Marxism. Ber Borachov framed Zionism in terms of Marxist class struggle. While Jewish people remained excluded from heavy industry in many communities, they would remain marginalized and separate from society. They couldn't form a real proletariat. In some ways, Zionism as a form of communitarian nationalism is at odds with traditional Marxist ideas of globalism, the workers of the world uniting in a post-racial society where national divisions are minimized. However, Borachov argued against assimilation, both as unattainable and as distracting from the importance of a true nationalist project, the Jewish people. Now, now that we've looked at the arguments for Zionism as a position, it's important to also look at the arguments about what Zionism should be. This includes the questions of where a Jewish state should be, locations ranging from Argentina to Uganda were considered, and how that state should be structured. Some of these questions are arguably moot, as there is now an existent Jewish state, Israel, in the Middle East. However, other debates over the rights of Arabs in Israel and the level of secularism in Israel are still raging. Some, like Michael Buber, argued for a secular Israel with equal rights for Arab and Jewish people, building on classically liberal commitments to equality and human rights, while others, such as Yeshiyahu Leibowitz, argued for an Israel based on halakha, or Jewish law found in scripture, as this was central to the Jewish identity. All of these points, this points us to a central question. Is Israel actually a theocracy? It's in a series on theocracies, so is it? Many of the initial rationale for its existence were presented as secular rationale, but being ethnically or culturally Jewish is deeply tied to being religiously Jewish. As we discussed in our first video in this series, there is a spectrum of theocracies. Israel certainly is not on the most extreme end of that spectrum. Its leaders are democratically elected, they're not members of the clergy, nor are they appointed by the clergy. And Many of Israel's laws, however, focus on prioritizing benefits to ethnically Jewish people, regardless of their religious beliefs, making this seem more like a communitarian nationalist state than a theocracy. 
that said matters of marriage, divorce, etc., are administered by religious courts, not secular political institutions. And while Christians and Muslims have their own religious courts, secular Jewish people are subject to the will of Jewish religious courts. And so in some ways, there are theocratic components to the government of Israel. Israel has also become progressively more theocratic over time, with the Knesset passing a new basic law equivalent to a constitutional amendment that recently required the state to preserve the religious heritage of Jewish people specifically, among other things, that lean it towards theocracy in 2018. Netanyahu's current crusade to weaken the judiciary's oversight is a step towards theocracy as well, as the Supreme Court has often worked to protect the rights of minority religious groups. Finally, let's take a look at some objections to Zionism itself. As noted above, these should not be construed as veiled anti-Semitism, but rather honest critiques of the philosophical positions. We'll focus on objections to the concept of Zionism, as objections to the policies of Netanyahu or past Israeli governments would require a much longer video. Now, the first and most prominent objection to Zionism, at least in its current form, comes from Palestinian nationalists, who argue that if Jewish people have a right to the homeland, so should they. If the promise of nationalism is that people should be allowed self-determination, why are Jewish people allowed such a right but Palestinians are not? Having been oppressed and ostracized in society doesn't give Jewish people the right to turn around and do the same to Palestinians. If cultural nationalism is truly a legitimate rationale for self-determination, it seems that Palestinians should be just as entitled to their own state as well. However, given the current claims of each group to the same areas, continuing destruction of Palestinian homes by Israeli settlers, and intermixing of these cultural groups in different land areas that would be claimed or required by both, two clearly defined states may now be impossible. One way to resolve this dilemma is through another objection to Zionism, to reject the idea of communitarian nationalism altogether. Zionism is founded on the idea of national and cultural self-determination. However, in an increasingly interconnected world where you have much more freedom of movement, the idea of an ethnically and culturally homogenous state continues to grow more and more absurd and antiquated. Zionism is underpinned by a rejection of the possibility of multicultural societies. Inherent in many of the founders' arguments is the idea that Jewish people would never be accepted in other countries. It's a refusal to acknowledge the possibility of societies that are bound together by a shared civic commitment to democracy, human rights, or a national project, instead of a particular cultural or ethnic background. It rejects the idea that, in fact, societies are made better through diversity, not worse. Israel not only embodies a country which categorically rejects ethnic diversity through the claim to be a Jewish state, but the creation of Israel led to decreases in religious and ethnic diversity throughout the Middle East and Eastern Europe as Jewish people migrated to Israel. Inevitably, any communitarian nationalism faces the issues of people with a different culture living within their borders, intermarriage, migration, etc., Without accepting multiculturalism, these issues can only be resolved through human rights violations, forced evictions, ethnic cleansings, the hallmarks of which we've seen in Netanyahu's government's policies towards Palestinians, despite the efforts of many Israelis on the other side of the aisle to try to make Israel less of a communitarian nationalist state and more of a civic nationalist state bound together by shared ideals of human rights and democracy as opposed to to a shared ethnicity. It's important to note that this critique is not unique to Israel, but rather to any country that is founded on communitarian nationalist ideas, where the idea of who's allowed to be part of this country is based around a particular ethnicity as opposed to a certain ideology. Check out our videos on communitarian nationalism, civic nationalism, and cosmopolitanism for more on these distinctions. Now, Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzwitz offered a similar argument to this, objection to this, arguing that because Jewish people lived throughout the world, Judaism was able to be a living religion, where people had an active relationship with God, making it a religion of reason and universal truths, as opposed to a static historical religion like Christianity, according to Rosenzwitz. 
Rosenzweig opposed Zionism and the establishment of a Jewish state because he argued that this was an attempt to bring Judaism back into history, and that by creating a single Jewish state, it would destroy the harmony between humans, God, and the world, which was carried in the heart of the Jewish people living throughout the world. In some ways, Rosenzweig is identifying the same unique feature of Judaism that the proponents of Zionism were, that Jewish people were often minorities in communities around the world, but he saw this as a feature, not a bug, of Jewish identity that would be stamped out by Zionism. Finally, many of the founders of Zionism were opposed to the idea of assimilation, that there was some danger in Jewish people adopting the ways of others or sharing their ways with others. Classical liberals and cultural cosmopolitans might object to such a claim for a range of reasons. Classical liberals argue that individuals are the only kinds of things that have rights. A culture or community doesn't have particular rights, only members of that community. And so a culture becoming uh, dispersed or diluted in some way isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's no harm in that, as long as the individuals within that culture are not being harmed, as long as the individuals within that culture have the free choice to choose the parts of their culture that they want and the parts of other cultures that they want. Similarly, the cosmopolitan would argue that individuals have no responsibilities towards their particular culture and should be able to adopt or dismiss parts of different cultures as best fit them. For these viewpoints, the individual has a right to assimilate and discard their own culture, and others have a right to take on some other some elements of that culture and discard others, because a culture itself does not have any rights. Only the people that practice that culture have rights. Therefore, an ideal society, in an ideal society, Jewish people should not need a separate state, as they are more than their Jewish identity, and such an identity can be altered to adopt new cultures, new ideologies, and so on, and discard old ones. The founders of Zionism might respond that the environment they were living in at the time did not allow for assimilation. However, as countries around the world become more diverse and more accepting, this may be changing. What do you think? Is Zionism a convincing position? Do cultures deserve to have a homeland? Is communitarian nationalism a viable justification for the formation of a state? Will it necessarily lead to human rights violations in order to make that state ethnically pure? Is Israel a theocracy because family court judges are members of the clergy that make decisions based on religious law? Should Israel be a Jewish state or a multicultural state with equal rights for Arab and Jewish citizens? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I know this is a contentious one for many folks, so uh, appreciate you for sticking through the whole video. Please be specific with the objections that you offer. Watch this video and more here at Carneades.org. Subscribe if you like this video. Hit the like button. Uh, donate on Patreon if you want to support the work we're doing. And stay skeptical, everybody.